Welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Sid Part 2. Joining me today is... I'm that Matt kid. And I'm Marlon Woo! Brando. Yay, Marlon Brando's here. This is a pretty big get. Uh, you know, he doesn't do a lot of interviews anymore since he, you know, died and stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Mr. Brando. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ian made me an offer I couldn't refuse, you know? <laughs> well, we were talking about the fucking... In, in the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movie how like they go out of their way to say with great power comes great responsibility without actually saying it mm -hmm. um and then someone was like oh no it's fine it's it's the same sentiment they just didn't say the line I'm like yeah but that's the problem is they didn't say the line so it's really fucking distracting mm. and he's like no it's fine it's fine i'm like well no it's not because if i do that with any other famous quote it sounds terrible i'm gonna make him an offer he can't say no to <laughs> Someone so, but, Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> so just if you want to have a really good time, think of famous movie quotes and then do them wrong. <laughs> um, Are you speaking to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Luke, I am your sperm donor. Um, oh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good time, it's a good time. Anyway, now that we're completely off track, there's a track. Uh, today we're doing a discussion topic that Mr. A Geek for Fun uh, picked out. What are, we, what are we discussing, Mr. A Geek for Fun? Well, um, this time I figured it's something that I've been reading a lot, because um, I've been doing traveling and stuff and visiting various geekies and gentlemen's and the sorts. Um, and that is superheroes in prose um, what if we take those funny books and all those pretty pictures and we get rid of the pretty pictures and we just have them there's hacking words does it still work why doesn't we do this more why is this are there things you can only do in this what is this medium because we talk about like superheroes in film and superheroes in comics but the world of the novel seems to be something that heroes have and kind of flirted with and we've had some moments of success and stuff but there's there's always a kind of a strange kind of dissonance between them it, it was always a weird kind of gap that people don't very much talk about it's because that i read i read true. comics because I, I i like picture books alfie i don't, I don't want to read them non-picture books Are you kidding me <laughs> like that sounds like a lot of effort man i don't know it's just uh, so much, man. There's like 300 pages and no pictures. Are you what the kidding? fuck? At least throw me like a splash panel every day. Like, just give me something. Right. Like, yeah, who, at least it, like a chapter title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I was sitting here trying to think of like what superhero fiction I'd read novelizations or, or prose of. Um, and I've got a couple examples. And it was funny to see Matt say... Well, I haven't read anything, because I know oh. that's actually a lie, but he doesn't realize he's lying. Because oh, as I was trying to think of examples, I thought of what is the obvious one, and that's fan fictions. Oh, yeah. I have read a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not that, like, superheroes have only flirted with it. Like, they've gone super hard into it, and it's it's become probably the, the most popular like prevalent thing of them it seems fan fictions have like I'm, I'm pretty sure by count have dwarfed all other written medium um so that's fun um 
Well, I mean, it's but, like a it's like a joke in the fucking fan fiction community where it's just like you know, three hundred page novel, like nah, not feeling that. But like a fucking however many chapter and word count fanfic, like oh, I'm I'm all about that shit. Like it's mm-hmm. it's it's insane the popularity they, that that they have compared to their more legitimate uh, brethren, despite the medium being largely the same. Well, mm-hmm. they, they have a shared ancestry, right? Because like novels weren't like a thing culturally until like the late 1700s early 1800s and so you basically just had magazines publishing fanfics of shit like the bible or or like old school greek plays as like weekly chapters and the writers would get paid per word or per page which is why things like crime and punishment are so absurdly fucking long and have a 10 page chapter about a letter with no plot relevance except for one fucking line that you could have just said as one fucking line, but no, he had to fucking write 10 pages so he could get paid. Mm. But yeah, I mean, that's fanfics too. Like, it's the, mm-hmm. the exact same principle except they're not getting paid. No, it's like, oh shit, I gotta put out a chapter. Uh, this thing, yeah. No, so I mean, it's it's interesting because I've got more experience with, with that. Uh, than I do with, like, official releases. But even then, I was trying to think of official release stuff with superheroes or or comic characters, if I'm allowed to broaden it out just a little bit more. Because I read the novelization of the film adaptation of V for Vendetta (laughs) Uh, all the way back in high school, Um, both of which still go harder than the Alan Moore comic. Um... That's and a then weird situation though, like it's it's like when you're trying to translate something into Spanish for a school assignment, and then translate it back to English from the Spanish you did, and you find out it's a completely different sentence. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was that was an interesting read. Uh, I don't remember much about it, but I do remember reading that. Um, I read a couple little things here and there. I think I read parts of the Greg Rucka No Man's Land novel, but I've never read the full thing because actually quite like the comic event it just as is mm-hmm. um and but no most like superhero stuff i i've kind of avoided or not really bothered with novelizations um i've, I've got like a batman scarecrow novel somewhere in this house because it had a really good cover and i assumed it was a comic book when i bought it off amazon years ago um <laughs> and I, I i got a prose novel i'm like oh well, maybe I'll read that eventually, and I think it's just collecting dust on a shelf now. Um, I don't, I don't know. There's, there is like a a thing for the official release version where I don't really want to bother with it um, because I'd rather just read a comic, the thing that the characters are from. Yeah, it's. I don't it's, know. It's funny because it's like when you look through like a list of like DC novel properties, you get a few big names popping up like you get Denny O'Neill you get Greg Rucka and like Marv Wolfman but they're doing a lot of like like Denny O'Neill has what appears to be a novelization of Nightfall and like fucking Marv Wolfman apparently did an official novelization of Batman Arkham Knight and it's just like and then all these original stories are mostly from people who are not big names in the in the in the comic book writing scene which in, to a degree makes sense because just because you can write a comic well that doesn't mean you're a good novelist but they're not they're and not really vice versa for yeah, the vice, love of god vice versa and vice versa <laughs> but but what 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 that tells me is that like i just don't know how hard the novels are working to like bring over the comic book readership to them like i don't know if there's a real push for that at all um i feel like it's almost the opposite Honestly, like I feel like the novels are, at least the ones I've read, are not written from the perspective of we want novel readers to read this. They're written from the perspective of these are for the comic book fans. We're just going to make them go to the novel section for something like the Walmart Superman and Batman books. Mm-hmm. Like those, those were very clearly designed to like attract a market outside of the comics. But all they ended up doing was getting the comic book people to buy them out of Walmart, and they had no impact on Walmart. Mm-hmm. Um, the Nightfall novel Dennis O'Neill did, and the Greg Rook and No Man's Land novels, those are the two big two ones I remember reading. They're fine. 
but they're not like particularly good novels. Like they're not they they don't have like they're written very clearly from the from the perspective of these are scripts and this action and events are described in a very sort of minimalistic way where the emotions coming purely from the dialogue and not from the prose writing itself. And so they feel very comic booky. And so do you think that it is just like a script conversion? Like they just took the... Because Rucka did a ton of stuff on No Man's Land, I remember. So do you think he just took like most of his scripts from a bunch of the issues he did and then converted it to novelization format? Maybe. And added Rucka some chapters did. in? Uh, I, I wouldn't know with Rucka. Maybe he did. I don't... I'm pretty sure that's not what Dennis O'Neill did. Because Dennis O'Neill at that point was like the editor of the Bat books. And so he was the perfect person to write the novel because he had a sense of the big picture but he wasn't the main, like, writing architect. But even that, like, Dennis O'Neill used to be a journalist, and so he's a good writer, but he's not a good novelist. And, like, they mm. really do just read, like, comic book scripts without the pictures. Mm, that's interesting. Um, and, and, like, I think that's that's the thing that, that happens a lot, because I remember I was reading a, a Torchwood comic that uh, was coming out. This is, like, 2018, maybe, 2017 even. Um, and kind of the big appeal of this book was John Barrowman, who plays Captain Jack, and his sister writing this comic. And I was like, oh, that's really cool, because his sister apparently has experience as a novelist. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool to, to see them working on this comic together. And it was the most incomprehensible comic book I've ever read in my entire life. And it's not just because it's Doctor Who time travel bullshit. It's like completely incompetently written and like it didn't make sense or too many scene transitions too many jumps in narrative it was just impossible to keep following and, and take in all the information it wanted you to and so it's funny to see that like you'd think oh it's just writing a novel but like less work would be easier but it's not and you'd think that like a no uh, comic writer could just go oh cool so that i just describe the scenes myself instead of depending on an artist to do to fill in all the gaps mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily work either i don't know it's just fascinating i mean yeah because I, I feel like with novels you get a very specific opportunity that you don't get with superhero comics which is it's not vaudeville. It's not you need to churn out a chapter every week. It's the opportunity to say, here's a complete story. Here's 200, 300 pages, beginning, middle, and end. And let's revise from the perspective of knowing that going in and being able to rewrite chapter one after reading chapter 23 and stuff like that. And so they should feel a lot more refined. And with novel writers, I can understand why they have sometimes have a hard time writing comics because they're not used to doing that. They're not used to sort of like the, the turnout of here's issue one, which would be chapter one of part one of a novel without yeah. any sense of where the rest of it is yet. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's odd. I guess it's, it's odd to me that the novels don't take off more because they should be such an easy cash in to be like, let's get your biggest fucking names. Let's get your ace list writers. Let's get Grant Morrison over here to write a novel epic because we can't let them do it in continuity or something. And that's generally not what they do. And I would I would weirdly think that like you could approach something like Teen Titans as a novel and kind of go for that like YA crowd, you know what I'm saying? Like I feel like mm -hmm. there is a lot of potential to play into existing markets for novels. Um, and there's a lot of room in these superhero universes to play into all of those different little little areas. But I don't, at least to my knowledge, I don't really see a lot of it. I've seen, um, like, I think I, I was at a bookstore and I want to say I saw like a Supergirl or, or some sort of uh, novel in the, the YA section. But that was about it. There are a lot of those. Um, I know there's one called Superman Dawnbreaker and there was ones like that where it specifically... Wonder Egg. Woman Warbringer or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting, like, YA authors mm. to okay. do, um... Do, like, um... Superhero pictures and stuff. I don't... I'm only trying to see if I can find the sales on those. Um... Or in the, uh... Did it do any well? I guess it's... Like, I guess that's pretty good. Okay, so, like, 
sold pretty well. I'm just, I'm just looking at the Superman one. Um, so I think they are making the attempts on it. It's just like most things you get with people, um, especially comic communities and stuff. People who read like good books and stuff, the vast majority of that audience to talk about it <laughs> like they're not going to go online and talk about the book they've just read like you'll get people who do it for sure but it's in comic communities that percentage is much higher because it's such a it's much more of a niche audience whereas someone who picks up say like the ya novel thing and after they've done their binge of like hunger games or something maybe they'll put a blog post if they're young enough for it but even then i, I don't think that's necessarily in the same sense of fandom we have with the I comic don't IPs know and stuff. about that. I vehemently disagree with that. I feel like you, you have not lived if you haven't survived the days of role playing online on Hunger Games form. No, no, no. I don't mean. I don't necessarily. Hunger Games was a bad example. I don't mean. I'm talking as sort of books that aren't like fan franchises. I haven't become French because every fucking thing's become a franchise at this point. I'm trying to talk about outside of like nerd fandom spaces, people who just read books. Yeah, yeah, that's what that... I'm also talking about. Yeah, I'm not he, necessarily he... talking about the person who likes Hunger Games and Harry Potter and also also is going to talk about things on like YouTube or anything. I'm talking about the purely casual, casual goes to the library or goes to Amazon and sees like, oh, the new book, I'll, I'll pick that up and read it and then puts it down and never talks again, which is the vast majority of people who buy these things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess like in that sense, like, Goodreads posting is nowhere near the equivalent of comics Twitter. Exactly right. Like, Amazon book review is the extent of that. Right, their, like, like you really want to start drama where you start the Amazon book review, but like, that's a much slower post than <laughs> on Twitter. Well, yeah, can, I mean, can I talk about something kind of hilarious that I I was pretty sure of, but I had to like go go and look up real quick. Oh, go ahead. Okay, so you just mentioned Superman Dawnbreaker, and that made me think of this. The other one was Wonder Woman Warbringer, a novel by Leigh Bardo, Lee Bardo. Um, and then I was like, wait a minute, I've got a YA comic called Wonder Woman Warbringer and it's a graphic novel adaptation of the novelization (laughs) (laughs) amazing it's It's like like the Prince of Persia movie game yeah or or Street Fighter the movie the game well no the Prince of Persia is the better one because it's the it was the game based off the film, based off the rebooted game franchise, Mm. based off the original game franchise. (laughs) (laughs) It's my favorite thing. Screen Rant made a post the other day where it was like fan art for the Batman, and their their post was like, a comic-inspired The Batman imagines what Batman would look like as a comic book character, and I nearly had a stroke reading that. (laughs) (laughs) Like, damn, someone should get on this Batman as a comic book character? What? <laughs> I go hard. Yeah, man, you might gotta be careful. It might become DC's publishing line, or at least half of it by the end of the year. Pretty crazy. I don't know. I don't know, man. It's damn. not so. The yeah, yeah. Comics, comics it's, needs to be on this. It's funny, because, like, comics coming out weekly, or, or monthly, I guess, if you're talking about the same story and being like kind of short form and and the way the 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 panels are easy to to screenshot and share and things like that novels are just kind of the antithesis of that in like every every single way possible like i almost feel like superhero fiction to like very neatly transition from one to the other it would almost have a home be more at home in like short stories and things like that like like your pulpy adventure short stories um but you don't those are just not genuinely popular at all regardless so you're never going to really see that but i almost feel like that would work better at bringing them into popularity than just having someone pick up a random novel well i think that's where you get the shared lineage between the novels starting as weekly magazine fanfics and Mm -hmm. superheroes being turned into fanfiction online where you get this layer of a new sherlock holmes adventure every month in a magazine or Mm -hmm. like a new paperback pulp novel that's like maybe like 150 
200 pages if you stretch it kind of thing that comes out several times a year where they're designed to be consumed really really quickly they're all about the punchy action and stuff and like they don't particularly care about like being well written prose they care about being like precise and efficient and so you get the most narrative so you can turn in for the cliffhanger and read the next chapter in the next month or the next couple of weeks or something and I think it works really well. I think it's a good idea because you get classic literary characters that are the mold for a lot of superhero adventures where reverse engineering that shouldn't be hard, right? Like, if Sherlock Holmes started in short stories, there's no reason why Batman, who is influenced by Sherlock Holmes, can't make the jump backwards. But there's definitely, like, a cultural resistance to it where... If people don't want to see, or DC would argue that people don't want to see Batman novels. They want to see Batman animated movies. They want to see Batman in slice of life web comics and stuff. But for some reason, they're not funding the the novel jump, which would attract a much bigger crowd. You look at people like Cassandra Clare, who wrote Mockingbird for a while. One of her low selling novels has a bigger readership than like the majority of Marvel's publishing. But her Mockingbird mm-hmm. comic did nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's... I don't know. It, it would honestly be really cool to see, in addition to all the monthly comics, seeing DC or Marvel putting out some sort of monthly collection of uh, short stories about their characters from prose writers and almost using that as a way to wean people onto finding an author of these short stories that they like and then and then moving on to, to novels. I guess what I'm saying is I feel like if DC really wanted to push or if Marvel really wanted to push novels for their heroes and get the comic book readers on board as well, I think it's super doable. I just don't know that they care to try. I mean, like, at this point, if you asked Joe Hill to write a short Batman story as a as a prose novel for them he would say yes in a heartbeat they're just not asking Mm -hmm. i mean i don't know why they would necessarily want them to because like i don't i don't really know what they gain by turning people away from comics and into and onto novelizations and stuff they're harder to have come out or even just short stories they're harder to have come out on a consistent basis they're um not really going to be something that like store comic shops their built-in distributors carry i don't really know what advantage they have i think it makes more sense to just put out as something you can pick up at like barnes and noble or, or whatever and just for general audiences who maybe can't go to a comic shop or don't have one can just pick those up and get some familiarity with the characters cuz i know like um one that we haven't mentioned yet I know Paul Dini worked with a co-writer on doing a long-form adaptation of Mad Love. Mm. Um, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be interested to read that, actually. Yeah, it's, it, I've, I've heard mostly good things about it. So, you know, it's Dini doing the Harley Quinn story. So how bad can he do it wrong the third time? Um, so, you know, maybe. Well, he maybe, made some maybe. questionable choices on the second <laughs> time around, so... I mean, well, I, there you go. Third time. Third time's the charm. <laughs> I guess to your point, though, we, we've done this experiment before, though, outside of superhero comics, and it's been a success, right? Like, you look at James Tinney and the Fort's um, horror magazine, Razor Blades, and that's entirely creator-funded. It's entirely distributed on an independent level, and it's a bunch of people writing short comics and short horror stories and short prose essays about those about the genre, and it's it's something where you can set the price you pay for it. So if you want every issue for free, you can get it for free, or you can pay for donation. And that book is a massive success. Like they they got they inked a multi thousand dollar deal to get it published in print by Image because it was doing so well. Uh, same with with Brubaker and Phillips on Criminal, where after they sort of established that brand, the issues of Criminal used to come with like huge amounts of back matter from like stories about true crime to short crime essays to prose crime thrillers and stuff like that and they've almost never reprinted that shit and you can't you can't find them anywhere no one's willing to sell them they sold so well like it's 
it's a very good way to make floppies not disposable because if i'm gonna pay like six dollars for an issue for like a prestige format issue and you're throwing in all of that extra back matter like i feel like that's a much easier sell than like four dollars for 22 pages where a lot of it is art or sorry a lot of it is um ads and the art's cropped in a weird way because of the staples and shit and i'm not getting anything else out of it like i would gladly pay seven bucks for a batman issue where the main comic is like 15 pages and it sucks but the rest of it is just cool shit like that mm. Mm, maybe i don't know but do you... i think you and me are on different levels when it comes to that because i would not um i you know like when there's like interviews and stuff in the in the comic or if it comes with like something else tangential to the book most of the time i don't bother reading it um i i don't really give a fuck about a lot of stuff like that i don't really have the time to read my comics as much as i'd like to anyway so i definitely don't have the time to fuck around with reading that shit i mean that's fair i but i'm i guess my what i'm saying here is you say you don't see the why it makes sense for dc but i feel like from a business standpoint it does even if a lot of people in the comic scene wouldn't read it like i think you would drive batman sales up if you included shit like that in the back of the issue is all i mean well what i don't like i mean you could almost approach it the way i feel like i feel like in an ideal world and i wouldn't say this about most things in this franchise but in an ideal world i feel like you would almost approach it the way that like star wars does because yeah. you look at you look at like the High Republic, and like that is a little section of Star Wars that is pretty much straight up. This is just for the novel readers. Like this is for the people who like the novels. This is for the people who are like into Star Wars books because there's such a fucking like history of it. And I feel like if you made a concerted effort to put out a like not just like a handful of books, but like an ongoing series or or a or even a potential its own little mini universe of novels that all kind of had a little slice of 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 these heroes like i feel like if you start trying to build an audience you could just kind of approach it in a different way and just say you know here are our comics here are our movies and then here are our novels for like our our fans who like reading novels like i feel like there's a way to do it i just don't feel like there's a I just see these random novels with like no real consistency, like no like no effort to make it a thing, for lack of yeah. a better word. Like I, I think there's there there's two th dimensions to this argument, I think, which is one of it is a cultural thing, and the other is it's a, a media franchise thing. On the media franchise side, you've got characters like Spider Man and Batman and Superman and properties like Star Wars or video game franchises like Zelda where it, cr it stemmed from one specific thing, but it's become such a cultural shorthand that people are fans of it from multiple different mediums. There are Batman fans that only play the Arkham games. There are Batman fans who only watch the movies um, or the animated shows or the comics or whatever. And Star Wars did a really great job after the movies to create a media empire that says, we have books, we have radio, we have toys, we have comics, we have TV shows. We have anything you can consume, there is a Star Wars for it. Which makes a lot of sense, and the novels are the things that kept that franchise alive when those other things were, were slowing down to a crawl or non-existent for a while. And there's no reason why something like Batman or Superman, as big as they are, shouldn't have the same sort of media franchise presence where you kind of see them everywhere all the time on different levels. But then the other side of it is... Part of the problem I have with, with comic book communities at large is you sh the only thing you should read should not be comics. Like, your life should not be the only thing I consume on a literary level are tweets and comic books. Like, it doesn't matter how good the comic is, it doesn't matter how good the tweets are, that's bad for your brain. And even Fuck. if it's <laughs> mentally, like, read a, read a fucking novel. I don't care if it's a Batman novel, just read something else. I think that's just good for people. Like, you should not be I only watch movies person. You should not be a I only consume Doctor Who fanfic person. Like, hmm. diversify the tastes somewhere, right? 
and for something as big as Batman or Superman or Spider-Man or whatever, there's no reason why it can't take advantage of both the popularity and also just have the nudge to say like, hey, look, scholastic book fairs have always been a thing. We're going to release like a $5 paperback Batman novel for your seven year old to buy at school. Like, why mm. not? Get them to read something that isn't a fucking comic book for at least once. Hmm. Fair. I don't know. I just, I guess I just don't see it. Alfie, what the fuck? It's your topic. You input, talk, use your, your British voice. <laughs> I use my British voice. Well, that's just, that you guys were all making pretty good points. And I think my main thing that I wanted to, I guess, kind of, if we're going to segue over to something which is interesting is, are there any characters you think work better in text or prose than they made or even not necessarily if they're just like inherently superior or just like they are just as well suited to prose as they would be to say physical reading and stuff because I think for my thing is I think a character like say Goku or something right is someone who depends entirely on a visual medium um be their best to be their best selves you can write good tags and you can write good scripts and stuff like that but there Don't needs give to it be away. some <laughs> needs to be some visual component to that <laughs> character to bring out their best potential otherwise you're kind of you, you really should be using another character at that point um but there are some ones that i would make the argument the wonderful amazing what uh beautiful spitfire queen uh she came up with this one and i, I do kind of agree with her is someone like Superman, I think, could often be better served in prose than he is otherwise in in um, because you have you can't unless you're being in just bad <laughs> unless you're actually just phoning it in completely. You have to actually try <laughs> with prose, and not everything can just be a generic fight scene. That you have to actually get in his head a little bit, and I think that would force a lot of people to actually see Superman a little bit more for the strengths the characters has, which a lot of them are quite cerebral um, in terms mm -hmm. of morality and how his powers work and how he interacts with the world. The one that really stuck out to me and probably the superhero novel that had the most success when it came out was Last Son of Krypton, which was written by Ali S. Magin, which originally started out as a pitch for the original Superman movie, but then when they went over to... Um, the, the Richard Donner film and all the stuff with that and, and the script being written by um, the Godfather writer um, all of that kind of changed but they decided to start, oh we're not going to write a novelization of Mario Puzo's script just use your idea and just write a novelization we'll just put Christopher Reeve on the cover. So Elliot S. Magan who had been a comic writer for Superman before that, did that and then the book sold hotcakes because everyone thought it was a novelization of the film. <laughs> it was a completely different story, but it's really, really good. And, and it, it helps set a lot of the things that we love today in terms of like, Lex Luthor's entire characterization comes from that book. How we view modern Lex Luthor comes from Miracle Monday and Last Son of Krypton, comes from those novels. And it's just kind of translated over to the comics in terms of making Lex actually like a layered and, and nuanced kind of character. Um, Superman's senses and stuff working differently and being very introspective on that kind of stuff. I always find that stuff really, really interesting, and I'd love to see more of that. But are there any characters like that for, for you guys? Yeah, I can think of like. So, like. I don't necessarily know that this character just on paper would work better in prose than he does comics, but the best Conan the Barbarian stuff is prose. Um, his comp, like none of his comics are as good. A uh, character who like originates in comics that I think is like begging for a prose adaptation would be someone like the question. I was going to say the question. <laughs> yeah, the question is like without a doubt. I'm just like, man, that guy's begging for a fucking novel. Like, just give it to him. He needs it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, now that Matt stole mine... Aha, that's, uh, see, I, I, I knew that was, like, one of the very... To me, that was a very obvious pick, so I'm like, I'm gonna get in here and fucking snipe it. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, no, you're right. It is It is 100% obvious. Um, let me look at my DC Legos thing here. Okay, fuck it. Martian Manhunter. I think Martian Manhunter could do really well in novelization. Just because, like, I recently watched the young, the newest season of Young Justice, which was kind of hilarious. 
um, because of just how blatantly cheap it needed to be. But I, I recently watched the latest season of that, and like the whole first couple episodes all take place on Mars, and they're all like talking to each other telepathically so that the animation could save on lip flaps. And I don't know, like, I just. You could do it in a comic, but I don't think it would necessarily work, and it would just be, I think, a good idea to spend time on Mars in a novel where you don't really have to worry about creating, like, a difference in how someone talks mentally versus physically um and i just i don't know i think you could do some fun play and stuff with uh with that especially if you could just like like the the idea of like psychic noise right if you could just do that as like a random paragraph of like half sentences from 17 different minds um as like you make it first person that could be really cool <laughs> I don't know. Just thought. Uh, so yeah, Martian Manhunter could do a novelization. Uh, who would be someone that can't be novelized? Um, part of me wants to say Green Lantern because it's such a big, like, spectacle kind of thing, but it's, it's science fiction at its, like, science fantasy, I guess, at its heart and that does kind of lend itself to the novelization format a little bit better. So I feel like you could do it, it just ne wouldn't necessarily be the best thing ever. I mean, Ian, you're the guy who made the visual Green Lantern story about the blind one. <laughs> yeah, but that's, it was an audio one. It worked fine. Um, that's, it's not a novelization. You can't read that script and have the same experience as listening to it. Um, no, but I think you're still, you're still taking away the visual components so it can still Okay, yeah, but I have a big, that. I have a big like <laughs> audio sweep component, so you know, eat a dick. Um, <sighs> someone that doesn't work in, that just could not work in novels. Uh, fucking Batmite, you couldn't do a, hands down. Batmite would not work in the novel. He's the second you lose the, the crazy looney tunes physics on screen or on panel it, it stops being as fun there we go you can you can describe it all you want it's not gonna be as fun as seeing it steve what you got oh uh <laughs> show me what you've got uh <laughs> damn um as far as a, a novelization that would work i feel like uh, John Constantine Hellblazer is like, I didn't even think of the question. My go-to immediately is Hellblazer because my brain was just like, yeah, it's a dark fantasy story about a tortured loner character who solves mysteries. Like it's literally the premise of half the novels that came out in the 1940s. <laughs> um, I could I could eat that shit up. I know John Shirley wrote a novelization of the the um the movie with Keanu Reeves, but I've never read that. Um, but I, I would kill for that. I'd, I'd kill for like a little introspective Hellblazer novel where you get into John's head a lot like they do in the comics. And those are some wordy motherfucking books. So it, it's halfway there already. Um, as far as something that wouldn't work, I don't know. I feel like in, in general, you can make anything work in any medium as long as you tailor it properly to the medium on, on some level, right? So... Mm -hmm. The, the only things that, like, really stand out to me would be things where it's not that it wouldn't work. It's that the other medium does something unique that I prefer anyway. So, like, with comics, it's paneling to me is really, really interesting. And so if you took that away from, like, a Daredevil story, I wouldn't be interested. But also Daredevil's the perfect hard-boiled noir detective novel also. So, like, you can do either. Mm-hmm. I guess Iron Man, like... I guess I don't really give a shit if I don't see the armor, but it's not like it wouldn't work, it would just be different. Hmm. Steve, you get like, they'd make like a really fucking badass variant armor for the cover, but then you'd be annoyed because you'd be like, they designed this fucking great armor and it only ever appears in this one novel and they can't ever use it again, it's fucking <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Fair enough, that is something that I would absolutely do. <laughs> <laughs> Top 5 Iron Man armors, like one obscure one from the cover of this one novel no one read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. 
But yeah, I mean, there, there's something about, like, there are certain comic book characters where, like, the costume or changes in the costume seem to be a, a common thread as everything else they encounter. So that wouldn't translate as well, in my opinion. Like, Iron Man has that where every time he gets a new armor, it's, like, a big deal. Um, I think, to an extent, Spider-Man had that for a minute when Dan Slott was giving him a new costume, like, every fucking arc. But I think we've since grown past that a little bit. Hopefully. Mm. Man, I really hope Dan Slott comes back to write Spider-Man. He made a tweet today where he's like, I'm so fucking tired of people accusing me of writing issues I didn't write. And I'm like, dude, you were on the book for 10 years. Forgive us for getting confused. Mm. <laughs> so wait, you were talking about like the Superman Dawnbreaker and the Wonder Woman Warbringer, right? Because mm-hmm. there's also I was there's also Catwoman Soul Stealer and Batman Nightwalker. Like this this is exactly what I was fucking saying they should do. There is like a I don't know if they take place in the same universe or whatever. Are they by the same writer? No, they're all by different writers, which is the thing that oh, kind of throws okay. me because like Night Batman Nightwalker is Mary Lou and uh Superman Dawnbreaker is uh, Matt De La Pena. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with any of these authors, but yeah, they're all by different authors, but all their covers and and naming conventions all look the same. So that's kind of so they are, they are, they are almost kind of doing what I was saying they should do. So good. I feel like the Earth One books would have made better novels. See, that would have been really fucking cool. Like if they had just been like, no. all right, sorry, no. Earth okay. One Wonder Woman's too good. I'm not giving it up. Well, yeah, you, well, you can well, fuck right off. Well, for <laughs> sure. But I, I think I'd, like doing an Earth One type thing where there's a lot of hype behind it and it's straight up novels. Like I think that. That's yeah, because really cool. like there, there's a lot of criticism of the Earth One Superman, and he, it has problems. But I, I am a little bit of an apologist for that. But that's totally a book that is begging for a novel where you're actually inside Clark's head more, where you're doing more of the young adult tropes of, of first sexual experiences and stuff. The Teen Titans book is just straight up a young adult novel. The Green Lantern one is way more classic sci-fi novel. Like, those books are already kind of premised as as novels just turned into comic books, and they were pitched as prestige format, like, movie releases. So they had that idea. They just kept it a comic, and it didn't work. Except for the Wonder Woman one. Yeah, except for most of the Wonder Woman one. Fair enough. Damn. Harsh. It's not harsh. I said most. Literally, the Wonder the, the Wonder Woman trilogy is the only Earth One book I've read, and it seems like that's probably for the best. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all you need to do, man. You've done it. Yeah. You've saved yourself. <laughs> no, the Green Lantern one's pretty good. I like the first one. I haven't read the second one yet. I, I tell you, I don't know what it is, but when I look at the, the cover for Green Lantern Earth 1 um like volume 1 where he's in like the space suit and he's got the like that is the only that is the only image of Green Lantern that's ever made me go hey you know what I'm gonna read this Green Lantern thing yeah it just looks fucking cool I don't know it yeah. looks cool I mean, in a way that Green Lantern very... does normally not look cool to me looks like a fucking wow. Damien Chazelle movie man it's fucking cool it looks cool that cover looks fucking bad like that cover Sells me on wanting to read this book, so I, I might do that. Well, people fucking read things. the book then. Yeah, people have said good things about it, so I should check that out myself as well. I okay, on the counterweight there. though, Earth One Batman is garbage, and you should not read it. I I have no plans to, but I did catch the Catwoman design from Volume Three. No, wait, 3. I can I can stop it. I can see, no, you you will read it because Riddler's in it. Fucking garbage. No. But is he? Is it a good take? You know no. how particular I am on my Riddler takes. No, it's not. It's your fucking Zodiac killer. Oh, get the fuck out of here! Get the. Fu- um, mm, I'm about to be irrationally mad at Matt Reeves it's, for a minute. It's so bad. <laughs> it's, it's so fucking bad. And Joker shows up in the third one, and it's just so bad. It's so bad. Oh god. It. All right. Well, we're we're getting off the novel topic. What, what else do we want to say about novels? Has anyone read superhero novels actually? Because I haven't. Except I've for some. About it. I'm sorry. Did, you, okay. did you get a chance to read that short story, Matt? On that, I read. I read small bits of it, as I was saying before. We you read before. small bits of the short story. As <laughs> I was saying before, we jumped on. It has been a busy day for me. But uh, um, right. that being said, because I don't know how to shut up about this, I've read a lot of like serialized sword and sorcery, like Conan, and that hits a lot of those same kind of beats as a, as like a serialized uh you know comic story does which is why i think that 
short form prose is, is potentially one of the best mediums for comic or for comic book characters. I just don't know why it's never really been done outside of basically fan fiction and a handful of examples. I think part of what's really interesting about prose is the kind of culture we're in now and the the way criticism has gone. You kind of can't blame it on a certain level for people to be tailoring movies to like the fucking cinema sense crowd. Like on a marketing move, it makes sense because people watch those videos, so why wouldn't you? But I think novels are more inherently resistant to that kind of writing because it's just boring writing if you do that all the time and those novels don't work. And so you can't really do that stuff. So I, I think it'd be interesting to like bring the superheroes who have become very, very meme in the last few years and very, very CinemaSins influenced into a medium where you, you don't have that. You don't have the literalism because it's all words on a page. It's all metaphor. So let's just lean into that shit and get really existential and get into their heads. Let's have the fucking Superman novel where, like, you really describe what it feels like to be Superman. Or let's get, like, the really tragic father-son story Batman novel where it's just, like, fucking who's afraid of Virginia Woolf except Bruce Wayne and some shit. Like, there's a possibility there to, like, put the, the high art of the British invasion that superhero comics had for a little while into a medium that's more naturally suited to it without coming off as pretentious. Mm. Neil Gaiman's not a bad writer. His Sandman is really, really good. His Miracle Man is good. But sometimes he does sort of scream as the kind of dude that just would prefer to write novels. And I don't know why he didn't just turn his superhero stories into novels. I mean, he... He's mostly just asked to come back to do comic stuff, is right. the thing. That, yeah, he has. It's just like, I, I feel like a lot of those concepts just work better as prose. Mm, no. Uh, whatever happened to the last... Uh, the Cape Crusader is really great uh, as just a two-issue comic. Um, Sandman, I don't... I don't... Like, I know it's got an audio adaptation now. I don't know how well that could work sandman i think kind of needs the weird visualizations that that book gives to it um what else has game and written in comics that's like really really notable well, uh I mean, some of the more like small yeah, stuff yeah. maybe um which is like his really big big thing because it was a prestigious like it was a prestigious like relaunch of the character after alan moore had him for so long and that was a really i've never read this um, but it's it's good. It's it's good. It's just again, there's just like so many literary illusions in that book already that it just feels odd to be reading it in without in a way that isn't prose. Um, he did a Hellblazer story, which is again okay, but like it screams to me of it should just be a fucking book. Um, Sandman, I I give you Sandman. Like Sandman's a good series, but. It, for my money, like his sensibilities are just so much more literary. Books of Magic is kind of like that, where it's so fucking wordy, it might as well be a novel. Mm hmm. I mean, I think that's fair. Like, he is, like, more interested in prose, but he fell in love with storytelling through comics, so I'm not surprised that he likes to do comics on occasion, and he, he gets pulled back into them every so often. It's really fun. Personally, I want Neil Gaiman to write more Doctor Who, but that's just me. <laughs> oh, God, that episode is so good that he wrote two. He wrote two. He wrote two. I wrote, only have seen The Doctor's Wife. Doctor's Wife, and he wrote uh, Nightmare in Silver with Matt Smith and the Cybermen. I may have seen that. I guess I didn't know he wrote that. But Doctor's Wife is legit one of my favorite episodes of Doctor Who of all time. It's so good. Yeah, it's fantastic. They're and Alfie lied to me about it and everything. He was just trying to make me mad. He's got that beautiful banger of a line where someone's like, fear me, I've killed thousands of Time Lords, and Matt Smith's like, fear me, I've killed them all. I know, it's, it's so, so fucking good. good. Apparently, Alfie decided to lie to my face about it, the what? bastard. What? Yeah, Alfie decided to just try to rub it in and, and make me feel bad. He's like, originally that episode was written for David Tennant, but then it had to be ad adapted to have Matt Smith be the writer, or the, the doctor at the time. I was like, oh, no, it could have been the perfect episode. So I, I looked like a fool, and I asked Neil Gaiman, hey, can I see the original script where it had David Tennant? He was like, no, nah, it never had David Tennant. 
That's huh? someone lied to you. I'm like, Alfie, you bastard! <laughs> <laughs> that lie make way more sense for Beth Smith than they ever would for David Tennant. I don't know what anyone. I mean, that's why I thought it was re like if it were a rewrite, you know, right? That would be fine. Like that line wouldn't be there, but it's whatever. Um, or like, could you imagine what a fucking bomb bomb drop it would have been? Like the biggest big dick energy of all time. If that's how you found out that David Tennant killed all the time lords, <laughs> it's just the fucking line. You don't even wait till till end of time to figure it out. Oh, that'd have been a banger. <laughs> he already said that in Eccleston, though. That he killed them all? Yeah, he, say he ended it. it. No, he he says he killed them all. That's the whole point of his finale. Is he's put in the same position with like the same button switch and everything. That is true. And then he talks about off killing all the dollars. I've yeah, pretty much all... only seen Eccleston, and I definitely got that from that. Yeah, it's like he's, it's, it's, he's just like he's, it's, that's the point of that arc. Is like he's like I I did it. I killed all of them, and now he has to do the same as it said at the time was of the Daleks. Now it's the Daleks and the the humans. It's the same position. So that's already established with Eccleston. Oh, okay, anyway, my bad. Back to I'm, I, it's not like I just yeah. rewrote, we watched a bunch of Doctor Who. I feel stupid now. <laughs> it's fine. Um, hope you hope you feel good making your friend feel stupid. Good. I Meanie. also made you look stupid in front of Neil Gaiman, so I'm really ready to <laughs> It's yeah. all just part of your sick games outfit. <laughs> the reason I I me it. this, Harrington. <laughs> 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 sorry, Steve. Sorry, go on. I don't know. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say to bring us back in. The reason I brought up Gaiman is just that, like, there there is, I think, a real possibility to to do stuff that is harder or a much harder buy-in or a bigger sell of superhero comics in novels that I feel like it's just deeply underserved. Where there there's a quota in not in superhero comics of action sequences, right? Like. You can't do a mainstream superhero book without at least one fight. But you wouldn't have to worry about that if you did it as a prose novel. Or there are all those like possibilities and layers of like getting your character to monologue or talk in a way where you're digesting it for pages and pages, but it's not boring because it's not one character staring off to a panel. Like Matt Fraction's Iron Man got this criticism a lot where you had entire issues where Tony Stark would just be speaking out loud to himself and the art would just ever so slightly change the angle. And people were pissed. They're like, he's just fucking talking. What's happening? But they're, but they're not paying attention to the words and they get bored because it's a superhero comic. But that's a tailor-made concept for a novel, right? It's just a character talking about their life. And I, I don't know. I feel like that's just something we don't do enough of with superheroes. And I can understand why from, like, a business perspective, maybe. But that then, if that's the case, then just, just give them prose. Give them short stories. Give me, like, a 15-page prose short story at the back of an issue or something. Mm. Maybe. Okay, let me let me run this thought by you, because this is something that's come in my head, and I forgot it, and then it's come back, and I forgot it, like, three times now. So we were talking about, like, oh, why don't they have, like, novelizations kind of like Star Wars did and everything. And I think that a big reason why it wouldn't happen, or why it hasn't happened, is because of the continuity hounds that are comic book fans. Like, you guys are well aware one of my favorite comic books is DC Bombshells. <laughs> and one of my... my continued annoyances in life is someone saying oh DC should just make Harley date Ivy or DC should just do this or DC should just do this I'm like read bombshells that's exactly what happens in that the exact thing you're asking for happened in this comic book published by DC Comics <laughs> and he gets yeah but it's not in continuity it's not canon it's not in the main universe and so if you were to do superhero novels I don't think that they would have the success which you're hoping because they'd either have to be set in their own universe with their own continuity, in which case people would just give it that it doesn't matter, it doesn't count kind of attitude, or you'd have to try to tie them into mainline continuity, which would be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole fucking 
fandom, I guess. I don't I don't really know. The point is there is a shitload of Star Trek novels. And they mm-hmm. have a very popular they they are very popular. Not a one of those motherfuckers is canon at all. Mm-hmm. Zero. Zippity doo da. Now, whether or not they are canon to each other, I I don't know and I don't give a fuck. But they have a very, very like massive line of these things. There are so fucking many of them. And so, like, I feel like if you're going after the novel crowd, that's fine. You could make a bunch of related but not, you know, canon to each other, not shared universe novels that are all Batman, that are all whatever. But you're absolutely right that your average, like, comic Twitter bro is going to, like, throw a fit over... I mean, fucking how many people lost their shit because, like, Visions wasn't canon. They were just like, well, it doesn't matter. It's not canon. Like, that attitude is so prevalent in fandom that I I think you're right that that would be a fucking problem no matter how you approach it. And uh, God knows I would not want them to feel beholden to, like, DC continuity at whatever given point it is. Like, obviously there are... (laughs) Imagine they fucking write their like 300 page novel <laughs> and then it's like oh no this doesn't work anymore you need to revise like the entire thing because we killed this character <laughs> like there's like a there's like a shared like you look at like Arkham Asylum and like people were able to very easily jump into the story of that because it like it, it goes from like an almost animated series like this is just sort of a culturally accepted status quo for this character and I think the novels building off of that could maybe fill a void that people like if you want to jump into Batman right now like Batman comics and deal with like fucking fear state and all this bullshit that you don't give a shit about whereas if there's like some novels that are set in like a more kind of commonly loved status quo and just kind of use that as a jumping point I feel like that that has a potential draw, because God knows I don't give a fuck about what's going on in DC canon I know right what now. you do with that as well. I think the very simple solution here is you just do what Star Wars did, and you just lie. Yeah. You say they're fair. canon. That's fair. They're clearly not canon. There's no way they could be canon. But they're canon. Mm. And you just let Yeah, totally. This You're is 100% like... canon. <laughs> just let you say it's canon. Yeah, because well, uh, then what you do, you get the advantage that Star Wars is now enjoying the benefits of of lying to your audience is you get to if you bring something in from a novel that people like you can be oh yeah this was planned the whole time it it really was canon oh my god yay (laughs) and then if the novels fuck up oh no that never happened it's just a novel it it wasn't in the books just lie (laughs) (laughs) so that way all the comic puritans will go and buy your fucking novels because Nightwing stan account XX5 needs to see this one where the Teen Titans go to the beach to complete their collection. <laughs> Don't care about the actual story. And also, you can let someone, an author, get to actually have room and space and breadth to create their own story without having to impact the mainline. And it can reach a wider audience than just the comic fans. So yeah, just fucking lie. Just say it is canon, say it is part of the main continuity, but it's set somewhere in the past. Or it's set in a possible future. Or it's set... No, please, actually, you know what? No, I don't want this. You know why? You know why? Because I don't want any art tour to work, to, to put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a novel, and then have the only conversation around it being... Well, this contradicts the canon, so it can't be in canon. And like that would that would be all people would talk about. No, that would be all comic Twitter talks about. (laughs) No one gives a fuck about comic Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) So I say do it. I say just lie. Just do the Star Wars method and lie for your fucking team. Call it Marvel Mythic or DC Presents else tales like some bullshit <laughs> <laughs> and people will eat it up people will eat it up just say it's canon or a possible canon or in- informing canon and then never never bring it up ever again unless you have unless it's actually good and then we'll use it because that's really all it comes down to is if there's a good idea in it yeah we'll probably we'll probably steal that one yeah yeah i think that's you're, you're right fair. it's just one of those things where like i i know if you don't release it as canon that 
some people, like a good chunk of the audience, sadly, would not give a single fuck about it. And the, the entire conversation about it would just be, no, this isn't actually canon. I feel um, like you can... Which, in all fairness... I feel like you can curb that pretty hard, though, by just having the mentality of, fuck the fans. They don't give mm -hmm. a shit. They don't know what they're talking about. These are our characters, and we'll just do whatever the hell we want with them. Fair. Because, you know what? Everyone gives Nintendo and Game Freak shit for Pokemon, and they should for some reasons and not others. Nintendo has never fucking listened to the fans, and they have never stopped selling their games. The moment you listen to a fan, regardless of whether or not the criticism is warranted, you've opened a floodgate you cannot come back from, and you do not need that in your life. Fuck the fans. Just do whatever the hell you want and give me good stories. Oh, and you know what? I actually have no say in this matter whatsoever. That's fucking literally what's happening with WB in the Snyder Cut. Like, you fucking, <laughs> you opened a floodgate and you can't... Right, like, no, look, at this point, you have to understand, and this is why I made the point earlier, these fucking people, this is their entire life and their entire personality. Read a goddamn book that isn't a superhero book. Like, go outside, touch grass consume things that are not purely your continuity content all the time and like enjoy the spectrum of human experiences and they're not going to do that and if they're not going to do that fuck them they don't know what they're talking about i don't give a shit what what nightwing ology has to say about nightwing issue 245 or what some shit give me a book that doesn't suck <laughs> I, mean, I feel like you actually kind of got some venting out there. <laughs> uh, that's funny. You know, you know, just to, I guess, to bring it all around, uh, the real reason why they should do more novels is it is at least a little bit harder to pirate a novel. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you can still do it, but there's not... I don't think they're going to make read novels online, you know? <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to be a lot thing. Of work or something that's even more work. <laughs> yeah, you know, so like... I'll actually take the fact they can't... It's less likely to post out-of-context paragraphs <laughs> than, <laughs> than out-of-context screen caps, you know? Like, I actually think this might be the best for all of us. <laughs> Encouraging <laughs> to read a little bit more <laughs> might be the move, guys. Also, honestly... That's what I'm going to do, man. I'm just going to start going to superhero novels and stuff. I'm going to, like, do outrage stand twitter but for like random paragraph excerpts yeah, but like specifically like black out the words that don't fit your narrative <laughs> i know <laughs> no just like just i'm gonna do it like taking pictures with my phone and like crudely white out the stuff i don't want you to read your hands over the he lied part <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is a good idea. So, so in conclusion, read a goddamn book. <laughs> read a goddamn book. All right, Steve, what's your book recommendation to all the Weebly comic fans who have never touched grass in their lives right now? Give us a book recommendation. All right, all right. I got Touching two grass, an experience for you. I got two for you, okay? So, for all of you fucking nerds out there who are into high fantasy and Game of Thrones and, and all of the mm. weird trippy science and stuff of fantasy, but you've never actually read a goddamn book in your life, or you've only read Harry Potter and Hunger Games, here's here's one for you. Oh, well. There's, there's a book called Little Big, which is a fantasy novel about a parliament of fairies, and it tracks the lineage of an entire family's relationship throughout history. And it's a beautiful novel about how your emotions are things that are sometimes in the moment and other times descended down from your history and your family. And if you try to kind of construct how you should respond to an emotional situation, you're always going to fail because you can't have a grasp on something as ethereal as your emotions. You have to let it happen and then let it pass. It's a very beautiful novel. It's very, very good. It's not super long. And for all of you deeper thinkers out there, that want something short and good, and you like Tom King comics, you should check out Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre, which is a very easy book to read. It's like 180 pages. It's super quick. It's an afternoon, and it's just all about a guy who's having anxiety attacks and is thinking about his past failed relationship. Very good. Very much sad man stares out of window crying and has panic attacks. It's, it's a good imaginative book, 
and it uses more brain cells than your average comic. Cool. Everyone else, give their novel recommendations. Go. Uh, uh, read, the old man in the sea. What was the read, last novel you read? Uh, Go. Read, read, read. Nightwing number seventy. <laughs> 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 no. Teen no. Titans by Chris Claremont. Uh, <laughs> Teen Titans by Chris Claremont would have ruled though. <laughs> that sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Okay. Um, so my kind of go-to, because I I legitimately just love this book, um, is The Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway. It's it's, it's solid stuff. Um, as far as like the last thing I read, I, I well I didn't actually read it because I'm a bad person, I guess. Um, I attempted to listen to One Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And I found out that book is, like, extremely racist, so I, I, I kind of gave up. Um, after, like, extremely racist and extremely sexist, where it's just, like, every fucking chapter, someone's getting raped or, like, killing a black guy. Mm, and it's fun. it's not a pleasant experience, so I gave up on that one pretty pretty hard. Very Alan uh, Moore. What? Very Alan Moore ass. I know, Alan Moore is a thousand and one Arabian Nights. So, this fucking cunt. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Narrated by the author. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I recommend American Gods by Neil Gaiman. <laughs> there you go. Um, a good book. Fucking what the? Okay, like no. The la I've been on Neil Gaiman kick because like the last thing I read was fucking Stardust. <laughs> Oh, it's such a good book. I love Stardust is really good. And then I, the thing I read before that was the first. So I have a friend who's obsessed with this YA series called Ranger's Apprentice. And I was just like, okay, fuck it. And I found the first book for like $2 at half price books. And that was, that was entertaining for like an afternoon. So there you go. There's some books. Read them. Alfie, do you have a, a serious pick besides Teen Titans by Chris Claremont? <laughs> <laughs> I seem pretty proud of that one. I'm trying to find <laughs> the name. It's by Al Ewing, um, which is again, it's funny because it's actually a comic book writer who actually is a good novelist. Um, is it that sci-fi novel he wrote? Oh no, yeah, it's um, Pax Britannia Al Sombra. So it's a it's a trilogy of novels. So just the um, Pax Britannia trilogy is really 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 good um it's effectively you know those classic kind of like doc savage 1930s like original golden age superhero superman type heroes were like very pulpy it's what if one of those characters was in a post-apocalypse and how would they very beautifully written it's very um very fun kind of premise that and again it feels very much like a if you like comic books and you like superheroes, but you've kind of always wanted people to just one of those writers is a deep dive and not have to do a obligatory fight scene or just have the freedom to just breathe with these scenes and these characters, that's exactly the kind of thing you should read. So, uh, Pax Britannia by uh, Al Ewing. <laughs> okay. Read books. They're read good. Books. Read books. They won't read. hurt you. Read short. Yeah, they read, will. Read short stories if you're scared. If you're scared, read short stories because there's a lot of good ones. I recommend the coming of Conan the Sumerian. It's a collection of a lot of the really good ones. Of, of what should I read if I'm scared of dogs? Um, uh, the Hounds of Baskerville. Uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sounder. Sounder is really good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I have no idea. Who's I've read the what was the name of the fucking book? Um, Old Yeller. No, it's it's actually about Old Yeller in in re respect though. Um, uh, no more dead dogs, I think, is the name of it. Where it's like oh, about yeah. how all the fucking dogs and all the like prize winning books die at the end. <laughs> it was a weird traumatizing one we read in middle school that took place after the Civil War with a black family. It was a dog named Sounder, 
And one day the dad comes home with like a feast for them to eat, which is rare because they're sharecroppers and they don't make any money. The next day it turns out he stole that food. So a couple of white people show up, take his father to jail and shoot the dog in the face. The dog like crawls under the house and then finds the strength to move on. They walk to the city, find the dad in the jail. And he's like, yeah, I stole. Shouldn't have done that. Then they go home and that's the book. Damn. Damn. It's a really traumatizing book. Had, yeah, sounds like it. I, I asked my wife what she recommends, and she recommends Tale of Two Cities because it's her favorite book. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're afraid of reading novels, maybe don't start with A Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if, if you're new to novel reading, don't don't start with anything by Charles Dickens, man. That that dude can fucking write for hours of your life. He's the prime <laughs> example of the person who was paid by page. Yeah, yeah, man, that must be a good fucking deal. <laughs> How long do you think it took for them to realize? Oh, they're doing this on purpose. <laughs> Dude, I mean, seriously, oh. even something short like fucking, because uh, I was talking to Ian about this. Even something short like, um, what a Christmas Carol, like. Oh my god, Charles Dickens does not shut up. Like, he just keeps... <laughs> he'll just be like, he'll be like, oh, fucking, this guy was dead as a doornail, which is weird to me. I don't know why a doornail is the most dead thing. You would think a coffin nail would be considered the <laughs> most dead nail. And I'm just like, Charles Dickens, stop talking. His KST is like that, too. Like, fucking Crime and Punishment is like 600 pages long, and I swear to you, it's like 200 pages of actual story. Amazing. Damn. Damn. Is there a is there a a abridged version of Crime and Punishment? There will be once I buy a copy and rip it. <laughs> no, I, I Steve, you should post that on Read Novels Online. I, fuck, dude. I, I swear there there is like a violent point in that book where I'm reading through it and I'm like nothing is happening. They're just talking and talking and talking and it's not even symbolic. They're just talking. Do you wonder if maybe, like, he kind of lucked into all the philosophical ideology and musings in that book well, just by of accident of, of, the, of the fact that he was just writing so much? Well, it's a monkey and a typewriter <laughs> situation, right? If you write right? enough words, at some point, something interesting will have to happen. Uh -huh. Use 600 so you pages, eventually something sounds interesting. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. All right. Well, I guess that'll be it for this episode. Uh, who's Matt? You've been gone for for a little bit. Um, we're we're glad to have you returned safe and healthy. Yeah, I had COVID and it sucked. Go get vaccinated. I mean, I was vaccinated and still got it, but go get vaccinated anyways. Yeah, please. Uh, for the love of God, get vaccinated. Wear masks in public. Um. So anyway, Matt, uh, we need a review topic, sir. I got you. I, I I was hoping it would be my turn because I know exactly what I want us to review. So the new the new season of this just came out. So I'm gonna make us review the first season of it. And and don't don't worry, it is a full season of a TV show, but it does not take long to watch because all the episodes are 15 minutes and there's only 10 of them. We are gonna review season one of Agretzko on Netflix. A Gretzko? Oh, I've not heard yeah. anything about this. Oh hell yeah! It's a it's a slice of life anime on Netflix oh, about Sanrio characters. Uh, so like, think Hello Kitty, except not actually. Well, Hello, you know, except not actually Hello I'm Kitty. Actually it's about just Gretzko. Just caught COVID. Oh no! I can't, I can't make it. This week. Oh, 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 bye guys. Sorry. I'm uh, going to make it next week. Oh the. Unfortunately, one you were telling me about the other week, right? Like it sounds really funny. Retsko is a Gretzko is about a red panda named Retsko who works her life away in a shitty office job and deals with it by doing death metal karaoke. It is uh, an extremely fun show that lambasts corporate life quite a bit, and it's very funny. And uh, season four was great, so we're gonna we're gonna review season one. It should only take you about two hours to watch the whole season. Hell yeah. Okay. On Netflix. Right, fair enough. Go check it out. Fun for the whole family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm and fucking Alfie, you're gonna watch it. You're gonna watch uh, it. And you're gonna uh, like it. Oh <laughs> man, this 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 Ultracron variant. Not how, I forgot how much. Really oh man. My ass. <laughs> Alfie's out. <laughs> uh, the Decepticons. <laughs> oh, no. this, this Phantom Zone variant really hit different. Oh no. <laughs> 
Oh, I always told Zod he should travel. If he's going to travel between dimensions, he should wear a mask, but they never listened. Oh, oh my god, okay, okay. Because I've just gotten the idea, and I think I might have just come up with the correct answer again. But let's play a game real quick. This is a, a wait, wait, don't tell me style game. Uh -huh. um, what is the next COVID variant going to be called? And extra points if you make it sound the most terrifying. So I'm going to go first as an example. And it's going to be the COVID-19 kryptonite variant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh shit, I don't want that. The Ultramax variant. The Ultramax variant. <laughs> I, I, I feel like in keeping with the times, it just needs to be simple. It needs to be COVID-19 plus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that, that's fair. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of just different prefixes you can shoot on there, but I got to go with the COVID-19 Sinestro variant. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I like I like the kryptonite variant because that just sounds terrifying. Like, oh no! I don't know. I got kryptonite. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it'll it'll capture the right wing crowd because obviously you would trust someone named Sinestro with the most powerful object in the world. See, I, don't... I mean, his first name is Thal. I'd trust a guy named Thal with the most pom yes, uh, Thal powerful Sinestro. object in the world. <laughs> I, I, You're saying it wrong. His name is Sinister. <laughs> his name is literally Sinister. I feel like you could. I feel like you could do like. COVID-19 parallax and, I, yeah. and I'm only I'm only thinking that because I, I just recently rewatched the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie for some fucking reason and I feel so uh, good time I'm so I'm so proud of why you the I'm kind of jealous right now why the fuck is Tamara Morrison in that movie that? who? Tamara Morrison he voices Abin Sur fucking Django Fett voices Abin Sur like what the fuck oh no he doesn't, I don't think he only voices him I think he physically plays him too does he? I mean he's yeah, he's I'm all purple sure. and shit, so I can't tell, but it's it's Tamara Morrison's voice, regardless. Well, that I mean, he's got a badass voice. He does, and I was just, like, surprised by that. That was a neat... And Amanda Waller is in that movie? What the fuck? Yeah, she's a scientist. It's a weird choice. It, anyways, we're off topic, but I... Yeah, Parallax variant. COVID-19 plus, <laughs> semicolon, colon, Parallax. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, until next time, everyone, I'm the philosopher. Uh, I'm the novel erotica lover. Yeah. I am the champion of the oppressed. I'm still Marlon Brando. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things. Fucking <laughs> Alfie over here, like, oh, Ian's gone. You and I are gonna make it all weeby, and we're gonna review Naruto. And then I'm over here, like, hey, let's do like a cool little slice of life anime. And Alfie's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not into that shit. <laughs>